Dr. Brandt speaking on On Being a Provocative Person. Dr. Brandt. Shall we pray together as we begin? Lord, I do pray that you would help each of us to center our attention now on this word. And I do pray that you would uh, help me as I present that which is on my heart. And then help us, Lord, that we might keep our minds uh, focused on thee. And help us to understand what you can do for us. And I pray it in his name. Amen. My own uh, form of Bible study doesn't just involve uh, sitting down for 15 minutes or half an hour and reading the Bible. What I've been doing for many years, rather than that, is to try to distill some biblical principles and then experiment with them in my life and see how they work. For example, a long time ago, about 20 years ago, as I was a new Christian and uh, began studying the Bible, I was in the field of engineering at the time, and I came across a verse that said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Well, I wasn't putting that first. It seemed to me that making a living was more important, or getting my education was more important, or getting some promotions was more important. But as I began examining what I was doing, it became very clear to me that certainly the first thing in my life was not seeking the kingdom of God and understanding what it is and applying it to my life. And as I began to try to do this, I realized that uh, I would need some background and some study, and I left my profession and went back to college in the effort to put first things first. That's been over 20 years ago now and uh, up to now. I even figured out in those days uh, how much I could uh, scrape together if I sold everything I owned, just a few thousand dollars. But I figured it would be worth investing a couple of thousand dollars to find out whether or not that verse was true. And I've discovered on the basis of, first of all, starting out by faith, and then on a basis of better than 20 years now of experience, that that is a basic principle that really works. Putting the kingdom of God and his righteousness first. And the rest of these things will be added unto you. Well, as I look around this world, uh, especially our country here, it's been my privilege to travel all over the world many times, but as I look at our part of the world, it looks to me like there are a good deal of uh, things around. Nice houses, nice cars, uh, plenty of food. And I told the Lord that if I'm putting these things first, uh, I'd like the ha latter half of the verse to happen too. That the rest of these things ought to be added. And I asked the Lord to show me how to add them. And he has. But there's a lot of difference between adding these nice things and putting them first. I talk to all kinds of folks in the consulting room. Some people come to me and say, I'm uh, miserable because I don't have a good job. Other people come to me and say, I'm miserable because I do have a good job. Some folks say, I'm unhappy because I'm not married. That's why I'm here to see you. Other people say, I'm unhappy because I am married. That's why I came to see you. <laughs> it's amazing, uh, no matter what level of living people are on, they'll begin to look around for some reason for their misery, and uh, I haven't observed that misery is limited to any level of society. For me, it's been a wonderful experiment to take this book and I made up my mind that I wasn't just going to experiment with this book for a month or two or three 
But when I left back to study, I made up my mind that I was going to give this book a five-year trial. After all, I spent four years studying engineering. We think nothing of expecting our children to go to college for four years to just get the basics of a, of a particular field. And so I would challenge you, if you are uh, just nibbling away at the Bible and its principles, to give yourself to it on a five-year experiment. Uh, you'll have to start by faith, but on it, it, by five years you'll have some experience, uh, too, to supplement your faith. Well, I want to share with you this morning one of these biblical principles that has meant a wonderful life to me. A wonderful life involving getting into the lives of other people, people who've lost the way, unhappy people, miserable ones, bitter, angry people. That's usually where we begin. People don't come around to me to pay me a fee to tell me how happy they are. Uh, usually it's the other way around. You don't talk to me unless you have to. And so we begin uh, with very unhappy people. And that's a wonderful opportunity to take a miserable man and an old crabby woman. and uh, lift them up to higher things and introduce them to a better way of life. Well, here's one of these principles, Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider one another. Look around you and uh, see who's here and uh, pay attention to one another. Not just a question of how am I doing around here, uh, what are my impressions of this place, what's happening to me, but to lift up our eyes a little bit beyond that and see who's around here, who could you chat with, who might have a need, to whom could I be available. Let us consider one another, not just be pre preoccupied with me and my sensations and my feelings and my problems. Now, lots of folks today have the idea, look, just leave me alone. Why do you want to know what I'm doing anyway? Isn't this a free country? Don't I have a right to pursue my own life? Leave me alone. Well, I'd rather make it my business to be available to you and to want to talk to you and to care what you do with your life. I care what you do that the most important thing that we can do is to make ourselves available to somebody else. I don't go around buttonholing people. I hear lots of stories around here of how people uh, get involved in conversations about Christ that don't happen to me. Uh, I can do all right in a great big crowd like this, and I can do all right in a man-to-man -man situation when if somebody takes the initiative to come to me but I find it personally rather difficult to take the initiative to come to someone else. Like when I get on an airplane, I usually try to find a spot where there are three empty seats. And I just soon bury my nose in a magazine. I get involved lots and lots of places, day in and day out, long hours with people, and uh, there, there just comes the time when I like to be by myself. But nevertheless, in our own way, any of us, if we mean to make ourselves available to people somehow, it's amazing to me how, but somehow you get involved. Let us consider one another. Let us just lift up our eyes a little bit and become aware of others as well as ourselves. And let us consider one another to provoke one another. That's a strange thing, isn't it? Let's go around provoking each other, it says. to provoke one another unto love and good works. I'd like you to ponder you. Think about you. 
Can you think of somebody that you're mad at? Can you think of somebody? And when they come into your mind, uh, your uh, thoughts and your emotions are cold and hard and hostile. There's a better way than that. I would like to challenge you to love one another and unto good works. Uh, and just think about some of the things you do and some of the things you say. So I'd like to provoke you this morning to give some careful thought as to whether or not you're the kind of an individual that goes around loving people. You see, that you don't do anything when you love people. That's something that's going on inside of you. You know, the Bible tells me that I am to increase in love one toward another and toward all men. Now, you just think that one over. Uh, you better think it over a little bit before you do something. For instance, uh, I love my wife. But well, I'm supposed to love your wife, too. How about that? Now, I express my love toward my wife by uh, hugging her and kissing her. And, uh, how am I supposed to express my love toward yours? I don't think you'd appreciate that, would you? Now, I'm supposed to love my wife, I'm supposed to love your wife, but I'm supposed to love you too, sir. Now, obviously, this isn't something you do. This is something you are. Going around loving people and, and uh, by faith asking the Lord to make you available and to show you uh, who you can minister to. I, I have a favorite spot of mine up along the Pacific Ocean near San Francisco, and every time I'm up that way, I go to find that spot. It's a high bluff overlooking the Pacific. And one day I came along to this spot. It's a place I go to whenever I can, just to be alone and to think and to pray and to stare. And there was a car parked there. I didn't pay any attention to the car. I went to my favorite bluff and I was looking over the bluff. And I like to climb way, way down by the water. And when I came back up, I walked by this car, and there was a lady in it, a pretty lady. She tonked her horn and waved to me. Well, now, what's a fellow supposed to do on, at the ocean when a pretty woman in a car waves you over the car? Well, I don't know what you would do. I went over to her. <laughs> She said, come on in and sit down. Hmm. <laughs> and there was a whiskey bottle beside her. I, I noticed that. I decided I'd take her up on it. So I, I went around and got in the car with her. She said, surprising question. She said, are you miserable? How about that? Well, that's a good question, really, when you stop to think about it. Let me ask you that question. Are you miserable? Isn't that an amazing thing that there would be a miserable person here in these surroundings? But there are. And all of us realize very well that uh, it's not really where you're at that makes the difference. You couldn't beat this environment. You couldn't beat that one either. What more could anybody ask than being parked in a nice new car overlooking the Pacific Ocean? I mean, as far as the setting goes, the stage is set for being satisfied and contented. And I was able to say to her as I thought that one over a minute, no, I'm not miserable. You aren't. She said, do you know what I thought about you when you walked by? Boy, there's a miserable fellow. <laughs> and then she said, and when you stopped by that big high bank, I said to myself, he's going to jump. <laughs> and she said to herself, 
I'd like to go out there and jump with him. That's what she was saying to herself as she was nursing this whiskey bottle. And then I guess she got preoccupied with pouring herself a drink and the next time she looked, I was gone. And she said, he jumped, the lucky, the lucky man. I wish I could do that. You know, that's a little bit twisted, isn't it? When you get to thinking that the most palatable idea, the most sensible thing that you could do is to jump off of a cliff. That's the way she was thinking. And here's this fortunate fellow who had the courage to do a sensible thing. And what's a sensible thing? Jump off of a cliff. Oh, it's a pathetic thing when you listen to people's stories and you listen to their reasoning and you begin to realize what makes sense to some people. Well, all I had done was crawl down to the ocean. When I came back there, I appeared. And that frightened her when I popped up again, see? <laughs> And that's when she waved me to the car and she began to tell me a very sad, miserable story of marital conflict and difficulty. And the best solution that she knew was to buy herself a bottle of whiskey and drink her troubles away. Isn't that sad? But I can understand that, lady, because that used to be the way I found peace. One of the verses that sticks out to me in the scriptures is, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, there's something about getting drunk that's pleasant. And I can look back upon my life many, many, many times for a period of four years when I was mad at everybody in the world and I was a tense and an anxious and a hostile individual and I discovered a wonderful thing, to me anyway, the quieting effect of whiskey, the relaxing power of whiskey. a wonderful thing for a man that's lost and has no way out. And people used to say to me uh, who knew of my life and would say how stupid I was because I was drunk and isn't it dumb of you to get such a big head every day when you uh, get through with those parties? And I would say to myself and sometimes to them, you don't know what you're talking about, the peace and the relief and the relaxation and the joy and the fun that I get out of getting drunk is worth a big head. What do you think people are sitting in bars for? They're buying something that's valuable to them. They aren't just trying to figure out how to throw their money away. They're trying to buy something that everybody is looking for. They're trying to find some peace. They're trying to find some joy. They're trying to find a way to relax. But don't be drunk with wine. There's another way to relax. There's another way to find peace. There's another way to find joy. And so I simply told the lady about Jesus Christ. Now I have a PhD degree. That means I've done a lot of reading and studying. But for me, I found that uh, th this little method we use around here is uh, cuts through all kinds of palaver and helps you get down to the point and I introduced this poor poor lady to Jesus Christ and I told her to go home and I'd call her tomorrow and I called the next day and the phone rang and rang and rang and rang and finally this sleepy voice answered it was this lady 10 o'clock in the morning she said this is the first night in long, long, long time that I was able to sleep the night through. Now, I don't know how the Lord is going to lead you to people. I'm simply telling you his ways with me. But I know this, that if you mean to be a provocative person,
and if you mean to consider other people besides yourself, and you're reasonably well prepared to share something that is meaningful to you, you'll find yourself becoming involved in those kinds of conversations. I had another conversation with somebody. This, this came in the mail. I opened it just since I've been here. Let me read it to you. I feel pressed by the Holy Spirit to stop my work and write a line to you. This feeling I have felt many times since I have had my initial appointment with you, but this is the first time I'm doing it. Now, Dr. Brandt, pull up a chair. Even in your extreme busy services to a great and wonderful God, and let your mind wander back to the latter part of May 1964. You had an appointment, 8 o'clock p.m. Your client, a tall, lanky, angry redhead. And she was a beauty. But she was an angry one. Possible diagnosis? My present psychiatrist said extreme psychoneurotic and further recommendations that unless something is done quickly, commitment to Pontiac State Hospital or some other hospital. But really, your client knew what she needed, which was spiritual help desperately and prayer, nor did I convey that need to you. This client had just gone through dark valleys, such as she and her three siblings, her brother and two sisters, on a Saturday night, as they were getting ready for Sunday services for the following day, her own close relatives used drastic steps that evening to push this family out into sub-zero weather. They were thrown out of their house by some of their relatives when their daddy was in the hospital and their mother had run away. Many other dark valleys had occurred during the period of time we were praying and trying to hold on to see victory from Jesus. But the one we loved so dearly, that was her dad, died tragically of cancer. This threw every spiritual prop out from under me. It's a lot of trouble, isn't it? Eighteen months after the death of our loved one, in a phenomenal way, I was led to your door for help. The initial interview consisted of verbal, spontaneous combustion from this client. Almost everything that had been tearing across the quarters of my soul and mind since uh, my loved one expired, I poured out on you. Now, how would you go about dealing with that person? Did that person need sympathy? What did that person need? Here is a Christian, a very, very angry, angry Christian. The only thing that occurred to me, I didn't know what to say. There's a lot of times that I don't know what to say. But this is what occurred to me, and so I took out my Bible. See what you think of this. Some of you, you're educated. You're even educated in the social sciences, and you studied ways of approaching people and counseling with them. This is my first interview with this lady. One thing I know she needed, I knew in my own heart that here was a woman who needed her heart changed, and she wasn't talking about her own heart. She was lashing out at those relatives of hers. She was lashing out at society, and she had good reason to, but her basic problem was in her own heart. Now, how are you going to approach an individual? You'll do it according to your faith. And my faith is in the transforming power of the Spirit of God. And this is what I read to her. I said to her simply, after all, uh, this had been a long, long tirade, and anger no longer she talked the matter she got. This woman was literally going mad. And why was she mad? She was mad at some people. But you say she had a right to. Sure, she has a right to. But whether you have a right to or not, you're the one that's going to suffer. Didn't make any difference to that poor woman's relatives that she was fussing and fuming and sputtering in another part of the city. They weren't there. 
She wasn't hurting them any. She was hurting herself. She was going mad. She was just good and mad, that's all. And this is what I read to her. I told her about a prayer that Jesus prayed and that she ought to pray too. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What did he ever do for me? Let me finish the prayer. I don't think we need to get off to defend God. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Do you have a grudge against somebody? A pet one? When you have some odd moments, you dig it out and mull it over and think yourself into a frenzy and put it back again? Do you have an unforgiving spirit towards somebody and you review what he said or what she said and what they did and how I've been treated and you say to yourself, I have every right to be this way and I agree you do, you have every right to be that way but I'm simply saying to you, you don't need to be that way. And that's all I said to this lady, you are an awfully, awfully angry woman and that's all going on inside of you and you need to pray. You need to ask God to help you forgive those people who threw you three siblings out of a house in sub-zero weather. You need to forgive them. I'll never forgive them. You don't need to. You can hate them the rest of your life and you can go mad you can get so angry at them. But there's such a thing as forgiveness. And you're going to have to forgive that mother of yours who walked out on you. Can you imagine a mother walking out on her four children? That's what she did. And nobody ever cared about them ever since. She being the oldest one had to find a way to make a living. She had a lot of reasons for being mad, didn't she? And yet it's for her that Jesus died. Now, I don't know what you think of it. So all I did was say to her, you ought to pray that prayer. And when you go away and you cool off and you come off the ceiling, think about it. She went away. And was she mad? Ooh, especially at me. I've discovered that lots of times... Uh, you just can't really judge an interview. But I know this. I mean to be a provocative person. I want to provoke you unto love. And who do you need to love the most? The people you hate the most. That's what's eating your heart out is the people you hate. I don't want to love the people I hate. You don't need to love the people you hate. I'm just simply saying them. If you will ask him for his love toward them. Now, I'm not talking about changing them. I'm trying to say love them like they are, knowing what you know about them. So four years later, I get this letter. Isn't that great? Let me read you once more. Key sense in his letter. After I left your office, and I knew you had prayed for me, Dr. Brandt, and I did too, there came a peace and a calmness within that I knew only comes by one praying to a wonderful Jesus who can give peace as his hand reached down and touched the turmoil in my life. And ever since that day has this turmoil returned, and the problems that, we, that are confronting me at that time and I say, praise to a wonderful, wonderful Jesus. Isn't that great? To this day when God's, when man's saying is, God is dead, what we need is more men with faith in God as you have. And my prayer is, may your faith in God continue strong in these days to let man know 
that God is very much alive and willing to hear and answer our prayers if we would only pray and believe and trust him. So I leave you with that challenge. You can walk around here this week preoccupied with yourself and what you think. You can walk around here this week simply reacting to what we're saying. May I challenge you, rather, to open your mind, seriously consider what we say, and put it into practice. If I were to read this letter to some of my associates in the field of psychology, they'd say I was nuts. But I know in whom I have believed. And I know that he can keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. So if you're tempted to resist what we're doing here, may I challenge you to be a little bit more objective in that and at least open your mind to listen to it and put it into practice like a true scientist would. Let's pray. I would pray for some of us who might find it difficult to accept what we're doing. But I pray that you would help us to open our hearts and absorb what's being said rather than reacting to what's being said. And I pray that you would help each of us to purpose in our hearts that we will be those kind of people who will consider others and to provoke others unto love and unto good works. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.